I'm righteous. You're righteous? I do what's right, not just for myself, but for others. You know, I'm basically keeping the moral compass pointed where it needs to. If he were telling the truth, he wouldn't have told us. Unless, of course, he knew you wouldn't believe the truth, even if he told us. So how many lies have you told in your life? That's the ninth commandment. It's about as many grains of sand as there is here. Have you ever stolen something? Absolutely. What do you call someone who steals? A thief. So what are you? I'm a thief. No, you're not. You're a lying thief. Yeah. Do you still think you're a righteous person? Yes, I do. Well, think about this. If um, <clears throat> Jesus died for our sins, right? What God would send any one of his children to an everlasting anything other than paradise or whatever it may be? And if Jesus died for our sins, why would anyone go to hell? That's a really good question. Let's get back to it. Hold on a second, Brother Ray. I think I can answer this one. So uh, it sounds like to me that that is a two-part question now, Brother. It sounded first... Uh, if God was such a loving God, why would he send a son to die, right, to suffer? That's the first part. And then the second part is, if Jesus died on the cross for our sins, then why would any of us go to hell? Okay, well, let's start unpackaging the first question. God loved us so much that he sent his only begotten son, that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, this represents quite a few things, and it is also represented again in the Bible through the story of Abraham and Isaac. Now, when you look at Abraham and Isaac, God made a covenant to Abraham 20 years before Isaac was ever born. He had faith that he would be given this son. He was in his old age. It was a scientific miracle that Sarah's womb was able to bear a child. Isaac was born. Now, the whole test that Abraham was faced with was giving up his most beloved son. And uh, you gotta keep in mind, one, he already had another son, Ishmael. And that was through man's intervention, through Sarah convincing him to have sex with Hagar, her maidservant, and inevitably gave birth to Ishmael, which then some people have proposed that his people were the Prophet Muhammad came from and the whole religion of Islam, which would tie everything back to the whole Abrahamic religions. But I digress. That's not what I was talking about today. Uh, I'll probably address that later at some point. But the whole issue of sacrificing what's precious to you. I mean, even in satanic, satanic rituals. I mean, look at freaking the Avengers. Look at the Avengers, for example. You've got the soul stone. What do you have to do? You have to give up something precious to you. Where do you think that comes from, man? That comes straight out of the Bible, from the Word of God. And they twisted it and manipulated it and made it mean so many other things, right? And they cheapened the whole meaning behind it and, and even made it demonic, the whole act of sacrifice. But that's what it was. Jesus sacrificed His life, His innocent and pure life, so that all of us will have a chance, a doorway to walk through. But that does not mean, to answer your second part of the question, that does not mean just because He's created a door, a portal for you to walk through, it does not mean that He's going to force you to walk through it. You still have to walk through. Seek and ye shall find, knock, and the door shall be open unto you. Meaning, he created the door, he's knocking on that door, but you, in your heart of hearts and in your soul, not just in your mind, must accept that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins because he loved you so much. So, yeah, if he's an all-loving God, why would he do those things? Well, he loves us so much that he was willing to sacrifice his only begotten son. And the son was willing to do the father's will. He sweat blood, okay, right before he was taken from Gethsemane. He was a human. Jesus Christ was a human. He walked in flesh. He felt all the same things we feel. All the things that I'm feeling through this whole experience of being diagnosed with autism and anxiety and depression and PTSD and OCD and all of these things hitting me all at once and my body just being completely destroyed by it. Um, I think I kind of feel, I kind of feel what he must have felt before he was betrayed. But yeah. Yes, He loves us, but just because He loves us does not mean that we are saved. We ourselves must walk through that door. You gotta be innocent or guilty. Innocent. 
Robert, you'll be guilty like the rest of us. The Bible says there's not a righteous man on the face of the earth. And the only way I could think myself to be righteous is if I had my own moral standard, which would be very low if I think a lying, thieving, fornicating, blasphemous, adulterer at heart who's dishonored his parents and broken the first commandment by having another God before him. If I thought I was righteous, I'd be deluded. Do you believe in yourself? No. Why? Well, the Bible says he who trusts in his own heart is a fool. We're very fallible. The person who put the eraser on the end of the pencil knew what he was doing because we're prone to error. If you don't trust in your heart, how will you ever find love? I found love. I've been married for over 50 years, so I follow my emotions, but I don't trust in my senses. Jesus said, what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? You don't want to mess up your eternity, man. You can mess up things in this life. You know, they're fixable, but if you die in your sins, it's not fixable. I think to repent for anything that I've already forgiven myself for would involve, uh, I guess, a parent paradox with the Bible is if Jesus died for our sins, but we still have to repent for these sins to a father that would never send any one of his children to an everlasting inferno. I mean, what loving father would ever would. If God's all loving, why would he do that? Cole, wait, hold up, hold up, man. You obviously ain't never had kids before, have you? Because uh, if you had kids, you would know that what you're saying is just stupid nonsense. Because, hey, I don't think there is any other human body in this world that I love more precious than my three children. They are my pride and joy. I love them and I have nothing but love for them. But yes, I am a fallible human being. But even as a fallible human being, I am more than ready to die at a second's notice for my children. So you ask me, if God is an all loving God, why would he do that? Okay, well, let me, let me tell you something. There are two schools of thoughts when it comes to protecting your children. One thinks that protecting their children is protecting them from the consequences of their actions. And the other is protecting their children so that they don't have to face those consequences of their actions. It's called disciplining your children. And in the Bible, it clearly says that God disciplines those that he loves. And you just said, if I have forgiven myself, and you've also said, if I've repented and forgiven myself, then why would an all-loving God condemn me to hell? Well, first, let's clarify the definition of repent. Repent means to turn 180 degrees, meaning turning away from the actions that you are committing. You had said earlier that you've lied more than the grains of sand on this beach. Uh, so that kind of tells me you continue to perpetuate. You seem to perpetuate your lying. Now, you've forgiven yourself for lying. You said you've repented from lying. And you said that you do everything to live right because you're a righteous man and yet you continue to lie. Huh. You haven't actually repented. And it's very easy for you yourself to forgive yourself of the shit that you've done. Anyone can forgive themselves. Um, there are people that have too much of a conscience to forgive themselves and hey, that is a very real issue, and I'm glad that you've forgiven yourself for the wrong things that you've done. I'm glad you have, but that is not the end of the road, buddy. You need forgiveness from God. Your debts need to be paid. You're not your own judge, buddy. And then to ask for forgiveness for something that's already been forgiven, it just seems like a paradox. Oh, now, hey, you just said to repent for something that's already been forgiven sounds like a paradox. Okay, well, you've been forgiven, but you haven't repented. So let's uh, give you a good example here. You are working at a company, and this company is buying shoes for everybody. And there's one messenger that goes around and takes orders on their shoe sizes. Well, that forgiveness, okay, that messenger is representing the, the forgiveness. And the fact that the company has already agreed to buy every employee a shoe is the forgiveness that you've already been forgiven, the debt that's already been paid. Jesus has already died on the cross for your sins, just like this company has already agreed to buy every employee a shoe. Now, here's the thing. The messenger must go around to actually get those shoe sizes. So she walks around and gets the shoe sizes, but you, are distracted. You're too focused on your work. You're too busy taking care of this or you're too busy fooling around playing, messing around, shooting the shit with your other colleagues while the messenger is walking around. And 
Then, two weeks later goes by, and everybody's receiving their shoes. And you turn around and you realize, wait a second, where'd these shoes come from? And you find out, well, the company agreed to buy everybody a shoe. And there was a messenger going around, taking shoe orders to make sure that you got the right shoe size. Okay, well, you were already forgiven. You were already allotted this shoe, but yet you missed the opportunity. Why? Because you weren't paying attention, okay? You were not paying attention. You were already forgiven, but you didn't take that extra step to repent for those sins and give your shoe size. That's, in a nutshell, what you just said. So, it happens in our daily lives just like it happens in the spiritual world. That's a good question, but it's actually a straw man. Do you know what a straw man is? What is that? It's something you create you can easily tear down. By saying God is all loving, it's a straw man. The Bible doesn't say God is all loving anywhere in Scripture. It says God is love. But he's not all loving. That's like a criminal looking at a judge and saying the judge is all loving, therefore I'm just going to walk. No, if a judge is good, he's just and good. And he'll make sure that justice is done. And the Bible says God is love, but He's also righteous and holy and you have to face him on Judgment Day. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Are you going to take it? I will accept it. I really appreciate that. Great to talk to you, Robert. Thank you. If he were telling the truth, he wouldn't have told us. Unless, of course, he knew you wouldn't believe the truth, even if he told us.